here we are again. Back with this super pro EPROM programmer, the ill fated EPROM programmer. But <laughs> I've been doing a bit of work offline and I've got it sussed. Okay, you may notice I've now got two cards. That's because I have higher confidence in these cards and I've built a proper one. However, I can't use it at the moment. I've got my original card that I built with all the sockets and I've swapped the D connector over to the other side of the board so that I can use the straight through cable that I've got. I've got um, some more D connectors coming so I can make a crossed over cable and then I'll be able to use this one. But what I've been doing over the past 24 hours is I have completely reverse engineered these boards. Uh, where are we? Over to my computer. What I did was I scanned in both sides of the board and then traced it all out in my PCB program and then entered the schematic off the website into my schematic program and sort of imported one into the other and cross-referenced it and found all the differences that were in there and all the mistakes that were in the PCB. There's a couple of differences in the actual schematic compared to what is on the PCB plus a couple of omissions on the PCB. Um, the additional bits that aren't on the schematic are just a pull-up resistor here, which, quite frankly, I don't even know why it exists. It's not needed for anything. It's a pull-up resistor on an actively driven line. If that was an open collector and gate, then fair enough but it's not. So, uh, yeah, I don't quite know why that exists. Uh, and the other one is the addition of this OR gate here, which I can understand being added, um, because without it, the this preset pin here was going straight onto the output of the NOT gate here. So you have the NOT gate here going into the preset here and through this AND gate into the preset here. And that could cause problems because gates have a propagation delay. You can't not have a propagation delay. That's the amount of time it takes for, us, for the signals to change on the inputs compared to the change on the output. And you want these two presets to change as close to, together as you can. Um, so this extra OR gate was just added as a, a fix for the timing so that the propagation delay imposed by this AND gate is not unique to that preset pin and this one creates the same propagation delay or a very close propagation delay for that preset pin. So as the incoming signal here changes the signals on the preset pins here change pretty much simultaneously rather than being very slightly out of phase so i can see why that one was added but why it wasn't on the schematic i've no idea so anyway, i've added that but what was most telling is on the pcb if we zoom in on here, these yellow lines here are rat's nests. Those are where traces should be, but aren't. Um, and there should be a trace between here and here. There should be a trace between here and here. And there isn't. And these relate to, as you might guess, these big red crosses I've got on the schematic. We have no connection between these two gates here, which is the main chip 
um, board selection logic. And we have no connection on this trace here, which, if you remember what we uh, discovered last time with why it was not working, um, is going into the clock of the flip flops, which are the pulse generator for the. Follow this down. I hope it's the HRDY, which was being held low. So it had no chance of working because not only was it had the um, the input to this not gate here floating, so it would randomly select the board or not select the board depending on what I was probing, where I had my hands, anything like that, even just whether it was raining or not. And on top of that, the ICHRDY pin would be in whatever state it fancied to be in depending on what happened to end up going into the clock pin from that floating input. So again, it could be absolutely anything. Bring your finger close to it and start oscillating or anything like that. And so, uh, yeah, that was doomed to failure. So on my test board, I have bodged but so neatly that you can't really see it. Uh, let me just bring my little scope camera in. And see if I can get this to connect. Come on, my fly, where are you? There we go, you've connected. And switch up to that. Right. So, yes, there is. Get this the right way around. One little bodge wire there. And those two pins joined there. And then that, coupled with switching the direction of the connector, suddenly everything magically worked. Even the uh, programmer having had 12 volts pumped into pins that it really wasn't meant to have 12 volts pumped into. It's perfectly happy with it. So I'm going to put this into my 486 now. It's a strange fit because of that backward connector. But it does fit just. Um, I've grabbed a random bracket it was on a just a, a cable um, and put that on here. It's not quite the right fit. The back of the PD case comes to about here, so uh, it will go in, but you need a space or a standoff in there just to, to hold it in place. I could do with either creating a new board design with all the fixes on it and move this down about five millimeters or so, or get a different bracket. Not sure which I'll do yet. I might uh, design an entire fresh bracket and uh, send off to send, cut, send, or somebody to uh, to make for me. We'll see. Um, but yeah, that's the one I will be using eventually once I've got the cable made up for it. So let's see now if this is going to work today. properly. Hey up, that's not plugged in right. There we go. I hope that's not just killed my my four eight six. That'd be sod's law that would. Okay, we've got the power light is on now, which didn't happen before. There we go. And we're powering up. Also created a fresh installation of DOS on a new SD card because my old one, the partition was just far too small. OK, 
Okay, I've got my network connected as well on this. Um, I've actually I've been doing an awful lot of messing around on this, and I've got a messed up set at the moment, so I need to reinstall. So let's reinstall the Super Pro software. straightforward to install. through the algorithms. The software itself does leave a certain amount to be desired. It's not the best written software in the world. Uh, not only is there a, bit of, a bit of chinglish in there, um, some sort of translation errors. There's also uh, some strange ways of working with it. Okay, Super Pro. And it says it can't find it. Right. Is that because it's lost its setting? Nope. Right. That's probably the angle of the card is slightly messing it up. Um, I can cure that first. Error message, let's choose something sensible in here. Okay. Not working, right. It's not happy being at such a cockeyed angle. Let's try again. No, it's not finding it today. Hmm, this was working yesterday. It's not today. Let me just check the board over. Make sure all the chips are properly seated. And I'm going to try a different ISA slot as well. Because I have had trouble with that slot before. You, this was working. That's better. 
it was just the slot and the angle of it. There we go. Right, so we are now in to the Super Pro software. Uh, let me just see if I can make this a bit bigger so I can see what I'm doing. That's better. Okay, so here is the Super Pro and its software. It's not just an EEPROM programmer. It also has a full test system as well, which is one of the things I'm most excited about. And not only this, it's possible to completely reprogram it to do things, other things besides just program and test chips. Right, let's start off. I've got a random EEPROM here. I've no idea what's on it. I've no idea if it works. I don't even know what type it is. So I'm just going to put it in. And I'm going to use a useful utility here, Auto Identify EEPROM. And it tells me it's by AMD and it's a 27C010 or some variant of. Nice. <laughs> that obviously works. 27C010. Okay, so now we go in here. So it's an AMD and it's a star 27C010, wasn't it? That one there. We go into function select and we can read it. Off it goes. <laughs> We've just read that EEPROM. And here's the data on it. I don't think there's anything meaningful on there really. I don't even know what uh, architecture it's for. strings there or anything. Uh, but what we can do is we can save a binary file. I'll call this unknown 010.bin. Saving binary file done. We've just copied the content of that problem. <laughs> I've also got all these random logic chips that I don't know if any of them work or not. They're all ripped out of old systems. So, uh, let me see. What if I don't have any glasses over there? Let's test some, see if they work. Um, actually, these aren't logic chips. These ones, these are your 2003s and 2008s, 2308s. These are logic and these are logic. Some of them are rather crusty with solder and meh. But let's see what works. Here's a SN74 FS00. This is quad NAND. So we'll pop that in. We'll go test. Auto find device. And those are all the devices it thinks it might be. One which is a 7400. So let's go for 7400. The interface to this is a little ropey. Device path vector test. That's the working simple zero zero, apparently. Let's take these out of here. Uh, 
Um, this is now my sponge of good chips. What have we got here? 74 LS266. For LS266 device passed. Nice working one. Seven for HC one zero. Rather crusty looking one with lots of solder on the pins. so far. Another 266. Passed. That's a 7407. Six for six. There's another seven four LS zero zero. Not surprised there's a lot of these ones around. They're one of the most common seven four logic chips around. And I've got an entire tube of them. Seven four zero zero. This one's rather bent up. This one is guess what? Seven four zero zero. Input non gate. Pass. The reason the quad to input NAND gate is so common is that NAND gates, along with NOR gates, are the two kinds of gate which can be used to make absolutely any other logic gate you wish. Uh, 74HC163 with short pins. See how it handles that. One, six, three. Test error. Right, what we're seeing here now is the first row is what it's expecting to see. The second row is what it is actually seeing. Zero is low, drive it low. C is create a clock pulse. G is ground it, H is expect to see a high, L is expect to see a low, and V is provide voltage. So it's expecting to put a clock pulse on pin 2, drive most of the other pins low, and see high on whichever pin numbers those ones are, apart from the last one, which is a low. But it's seeing lows instead of highs. It might just be because the pins are short and it's not making good contact. Nope. Let's just wiggle it a bit. No, it's not happy at all, that one. So that one, I think, is dead. 7.4HC163. I'll throw that on to the side there as a dead chip. What's next? 
74 LS 83. I know what the 83 is. And neither does it know what the 83 is. 7483, that is correct, isn't it? 74LS83AN. It doesn't know the 83. What is a 74LS83? That would be a 4-bit binary full adder with fast carry. Okay. So it accepts two 4-bit binary words and carry input. It generates the binary sum outputs and the carry output for the most significant bit. Okay. Oh, hi, uh, Freeman Sun. ISA, it's Industry Standard Architecture. It's the, the name of the main bus in old computers. Um, my audio is quite hacked off does it um i shouldn't do i've not got any compression or anything on it um i'm not dropping any frames um i'm running at 2.7 megabits per second at the moment and i've got 10 megabits per second bandwidth um Let me just check up. No, I've got no um, no filter running at all at the moment. Um, it may just be me that's unable to speak. <laughs> um, anyway, right. What was I going to do? Yes. Uh, if I can get my scope reconnected. The ISA is a bit dark down here. Um, these big old chunky connectors in the old computers. In this case, my 486. And it can be useful if you want to try uh, switching networks, but uh, it's hacked in time with some artifacts. I mean, it may just be overly compressed, possibly. I mean, it's, it's it seems fine on the on the VU meter here. There's no uh, sudden dropouts or anything, but. Uh, I shall grab my phone. And this might cause a certain amount of. If I were to pop in one of my Raycon earbuds, not a sponsor, just to stop feedback, and I shall. Join my own stream.
turn on audio and see how it sounds to me. Oh, I see what you mean. It's a sort of comes and goes and stutters. That is weird. I wonder. Let me just try. microphone rather than my Pell microphone. No, that's not stuttering. Hmm. Let me try switching over to a completely different capture device. If I can. <laughs> yeah, the um remote microphone is turned down because it's also the capture device for my Pell microphone which is a lot louder. Okay, I've switched over to a different capture device now. That's much better, isn't it? Oh, I wonder... Because I also record all my audio locally, and I'm wondering if that's what's, what's interfering with it. Let me switch back to my... And terminate the local recording. Is that... Ah, that must be it. Right, I think we've got it sussed. So I need to sort out my local recording. Right, thank you for, for pointing that problem out for me. That's uh, a bit of a strange one, but yeah, I think we've got that sorted now. Okay, right. <laughs> Where were we? Yes. I was looking at the 74, what was this? 7483, wasn't I? Um, yeah, the Super Pro software doesn't know what it is. But we can use the Super Pro software. Theoretically, <laughs> I say yes. Well, that's the that's the problem with TLAs; they're uh, limited in uh, numbers of combinations. <laughs> yes, I say instruction set architecture or uh, industry standard architecture. In this case, it's industry standard architecture. <laughs> the ISA bus, to be precise. <laughs> Um, okay, so here we can create new patterns. So let's create the 7483, which has 18, no, 16 pins on it. Okay, and now we can create a new pattern for it. But how are we going to have this then? Pin. Mm. This has a strange pin out because pin five is VCC. 
and pin 12 is ground rather than the usual diagonals. So A1 to A4 is operand. <laughs> oh, I used to build and sell computers uh, that were ISA based many, many, many years ago. I used to have my own uh, computer shop back in the early 90s. Late late nineties. No, I, I worked for a computer shop in the early nineties, and I had my own computer shop in the late nineties. So yes, I used to build three eight sixes and four eight sixes on a daily basis. Um, it was interesting times getting things to work together because there was no or very little auto configuration. It was a case of having to set jumpers so they didn't conflict with each other, and yeah, it was <laughs> it was interesting. So much easier now with PCIe, just plug it in and off it goes. But it was so much manual resource management back then. It's also so much bigger and chunkier. Easier to work with in some ways, but uh, could be an absolute nightmare if you have more than just a, a few things plugged in at once. Um, okay, so operand A and operand B are A1 to A4, B1 to B4, which are... all over the place, scattered all over the place. And then you've got C4 as the carry output, C0 as the carry input. So I'm going to have carry input C0, which according to this data sheet is on pin 13. I'm going to have it as a zero. Then carry output I would expect well it depends on the inputs let's have let's add two and three and see if we get five so operand a binary two will be zero one zero zero so a one is pin ten pin co-processors that used ISA as a means to stay in contact. Perfectly possible, yes. I mean, certainly you used to have add-on cards for other systems which provided ISA. Um, a co-processor you'd normally have actually on the motherboard or inside the chip for math, a maths co-processor. Um... Would it be possible over ISA? I don't imagine it would be a possible over ISA. I mean, I'm not aware of a specific card that did it. Um, I mean, certainly on things like the old IBM 5150, you had a separate socket on the motherboard for the coprocessor. On sort of 386s, you'd have a, a 387 socket on the motherboard. Um, on some early 486s you would as well, but uh, in general you'd have, certainly for 486s, the coprocessor is inside the chip. So, uh, I mean, for very early systems, I mean, Microsoft made a an add-on board, an ISA add-on board. It wasn't a, a coprocessor as such, it was a, a replacement processor. Um, I forget what they called it now, um, but it was an ISA board, but you had to take out your existing processor and plug in a ribbon cable into the socket where the processor was. Um, so there's obviously some vital signals that aren't on ISA. Um, but no, I've not, I've not come across a, a co-processor board. As such, no. Um, I think it's if it's going to be sort of an 8087 or 287, 387 equivalent maths coprocessor, I think it's unlikely because I think the interrupt signal that it uses isn't provided on the ISA bus. 
so you would have to have some extra connection coming from the card to somewhere else on the motherboard to pick up that signal um, so I think it's unlikely but I mean it says there's, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't have an ISA card with a, some other processor on it for doing a specific job but uh, and that's that's a the vector engine that'll be a vector coprocessor which is it's more like a GPU for doing specific tasks uh, the in the times of ISA there was only really the processor and the coprocessor which was the maths coprocessor um, GPUs there was no real concept of offloading work onto the GPU because it was in general a one direction connection you'd push data out to the GPU and it would display it or it would calculate it and display it there wasn't really the uh, the backwards and forwards of information that you have now because and the ISA bus is by today's standards horrendously slow even by th the 486 standards the ISA bus is slow which is why you had things like the Visa local bus and the PCI bus for faster communication um, but even that is very slow by today's standards. I mean, but yeah, you could certainly have an ISA card to do specific tasks with a processor of some form on it, such as a vector processor as you've got on your PCIe one. Um, but it would have to be an incredibly complex operation to make it worthwhile um, compared to what you can do with the co the uh, floating point code processor and the CPU of its day um, because the overhead in transferring enough data to a code processor over ISA to do the operation on and then return it would be it would need to be a very very complicated operation in order for it to be faster than faster to do that transfer do the operation and bring it back again than just to do it in the coprocessor the numeric coprocessor um, so yeah the ISA it's more aimed at originally there was communications cards graphics cards and memory cards on the ISA really um, over time the memory disappeared and it all became on the motherboard graphics cards eventually got integrated into the motherboard and moved over or moved over to faster buses so really it was only sort of sound cards network cards um, serial parallel that sort of thing um, things which I mean even now that if there is an ISA bus in most modern computers it's just you don't really get at it um, things like the keyboard and um, various sensors on the motherboard and things like that are actually on the ISA bus built into the computer but the speed of the ISA bus is so slow that moving large amounts of data around is pointless really <laughs> so yeah I mean, as I say you could you there's no reason why you couldn't have a dedicated board for doing a specific set of instructions on ISA but I say it would have to be incredibly complicated to make it worthwhile um, I dare say there were boards. I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd would get things like um, early FPGAs and things like that on ISA boards, um, but they were more aimed at hardware development rather than number crunching. Um, it was more that or, or that or for processing of large amounts of external data rather than internal, so sensors and things and. Um, communication device or whatever would, would dump large amounts of data in to the FPGA on the ISA card which would then process it and then return it to the CPU 
rather than the CPU sending data to it to be processed and come back again. That's more the sort of ISA off-board processing that you'd get rather than, um, a, say, a vector processor. It's only really with high-speed buses like PCIe where the offloading of processing has become more viable. Um, so, yeah, it's... It's a different world back then, really, for, for interfacing. Because, um, I mean, PCIe, we're talking gigabit or gigatransfer, gigatransfers per second, or gigatransactions per second, rather. Whereas the, uh, the ISA bus originally operated at about 4 megahertz, which was the speed of the 8088 processor. The specifications for it top it out at 8 megahertz, although the, I think the, v, the V20 processor, which was a replacement for the 8088, would run at 10 megahertz. And the ISA bus was typically locked to the speed of the processor originally. Um, with more powerful processors, the ISA bus became an extension of the chipset and the chipset would generate the clock and everything, so it was locked more reliably to 8 MHz now. So this is a 66 MHz processor in here with a 33 MHz bus speed. And that 33 MHz is the speed of the PCI bus, but the ISA bus is still only 8 MHz. <laughs> so yes, the ISA is by today's standards, an absolute snail's pace. Um, so if you can imagine trying to sort of transfer megabytes worth of data over the ISA bus, it would take in the order of fractions of a second rather than fractions of a microsecond. Uh, so if you wanted to process, say, 10 megabytes of data, then you had 48 meg of RAM, say. Transferring that 10 megabytes of data would take literally a good second. <laughs> I can't always, so I may have done it. Uh, may have may be quoting completely uh, erroneous figures there. So. <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's a very slow bus by today's standards. Uh, yeah, right. Anyway, back to uh, back to the uh, 7483. I wanted to input the value 2 to, op to operand A, so A2 is pin, pin 8, A2 pin 8, I want to set that to a 1, A3 is, A3 is pin 3, set that to a 0, and A4 to a 0. We'll see if this chip can do math. Um, so we wanted to add two and five. <laughs> I do like PCIe for its power and ease of plugging things in and getting them working, but I do like ISA because it's so hackable and easy to work with. But certainly for, for anything other than just tinkering with old hardware, PCIe just blows everything out of the water. To the extent now that even uh, even your hard drive is PCIe. <laughs> okay, so we wanted to add five, didn't we? Which is zero one zero one. No, one yeah, zero one zero one. So B one is pin eleven, and I want that to be a one. B2 is pin 7. I want that to be a 0. B3 is pin 4. I want that to be a 1. And B4 is 16. I want that to be a 0. So that should give us 7. Which is 0, 1, 1, 1. So, on the sum, I would expect 
sum one pin nine i would expect that to be high sum two pin six i would expect that to be high sum three pin two i would expect to be high and sum four pin 15 i would expect to be low carry out pin 13 i would expect to be low what am i missing here pin 10 pin 10 that's a1 why have i missed pin 10 that should be a zero right that should give us a very quick crude test yes i want to save and apparently that passed the vector test so we can add extra chips that it doesn't know about i could add other sums in there as well for testing to give it a more thorough test but for now i'm happy with that i'll call that a working chip for now though i may revisit that chip offline later on okay what's next in our arsenal Ooh, 74 hc 4060 that one it may not know about 744060 no it doesn't know it but it might know the 4060 no that's another one that we'd need to add manually i'll put that on one side to deal with later because i just want to quickly get through these how about a 4040 That passed. Excellent. 74HC132. Keep going for the wrong keyboard here. 74132. Passed. Uh, 7483 again. That's the one we just created, isn't it? 7483, it's passed. Uh, 74HCU04, not sure what the U stands for in there. This is a bit chewed up with this pin, this chip. Obviously desoldered from some board at some point. That passed. Surprisingly, it's really quite gnarly. And this one, I've soldered. Oh, it's got pin, another pin. It's got numerous pins missing on this 74HC32. There's no way that's going to work. This one is oh, really gnarly with solder. I can't even see what number it is. That's going to need cleaning up before I can test it. And finally, the 74S00 again. device passed excellent so i've got all these working logic chips one that needs a clean up before i can test it and one that i need to create a new profile for so let's just pop these into here for safekeeping i shall deal with these two later on I'm sure you see me testing enough chips for now. Right. One thing this doesn't do is modern chips. Um, let me get a modern flash chip. 
my favourite ones are the, uh, the SST 39 SF series, uh, especially the SF 040, nice big chip. And I use these 39 SF chips a lot because they're 5 volt, which is quite rare these days. They're flash chips, so they're easy to program and reuse. And they're high capacity. But it doesn't know what they are. <laughs> However, there is a whole other piece of software. which doesn't work very well with the programmer. <laughs> it says it can't find it, but it is actually a lie. It does find it. But what this program is, is the IDE for creating entire new programming algorithms. It's written in a language they call DCL, device control language. It's their, it's their own weird language. It's a, a bit like C in a lot of ways, which is nice. I like C. But with these special instructions in it. They're very weird instructions. And it's got some a strange declaration bit at the beginning, which is reminiscent of Pascal or COBOL. Um, so it's sort of like a, a header that describes the programming environment and the chip, what the pins are and all that sort of thing, what voltages you have. Um, and yeah, you can define all your own programming logic using it. But it's so uh, ropey, it doesn't actually work. <laughs> I mean, th this works. I can compile this and operate on it and run it and read from the chip. I don't know if there's anything on this chip. Actually, I've got the wrong settings on here. Um, there's Alt E, chip end, that should be a seven there. Alt E, U and read. Because this IDE creates the algorithm for how to do the programming. It doesn't define the chip as such. There's another program, the library generator, which connects this algorithm with data in the main programming system. But that library generator does not work. Either Well, the library that's with the main Super Pro 2 software appears to be slightly corrupt and the library generator really doesn't like it. But if I were to use to delete that library and recreate it completely from scratch using the library generator it might work better in future but that's a lot of work regenerating that whole library. So what I might do actually is have two separate installations one with the original library and one ju with just my own custom chips. Um, but yeah, that just read the whole contents of this chip, which is blank. But of course I can uh, erase it and do a blank check. It was already blank, so uh, <laughs> that would have done pretty much nothing. the way that the library generator works is really a janky piece of software. Um, but yeah, the anatomy of this, <coughs> you start off with a declaration section which defines what functions you're going to be implementing, who made the device and what its device name is. Then a list of pin numbers so pin names from pin 1 to pin 32 on this in sequence. 
anything with a number after it is addressable as a subscript later on. Uh, and then you have a main function where you get to choose what operation you're performing and call functions accordingly. To actually do operations, let's take a look at the read for example, you have to have sort of nested loops based on bytes of the address. Bit uh, awkward to do that, but perfectly doable. And twiddle the address bits and set pins high and low as you need and read them in store the data away or compare it with what's exist existing there or it's, it's quite an easy programming language to get to grips with so long as you know C but there are some strange things like uh, if you're doing an if else you do if this then this semicolon else <laughs> you've got to have the semicolon there it's weird it's like the else is a completely separate instruction but uh, yeah, and the compiling, if you have a, an error and you compile it, it tells you roughly where the error is. But you can't actually go to where that error is and it's the line different anyway. It says an error on line 87, but it's actually on 86. <laughs> so yeah, it's a bit of a janky software. Um, but the library generator, this is really, really uh, jank. You can create and update manufacturers, which just means changing the name or creating the name for them. You can create and update devices um, let's take the good old AMD 27C256, which is just the name of the device, an information code, which is a cryptic number, which is a number you have to know, and whether it's a memory or a um, PLD. But that device information code relates to an entry in this table here and you can't look up you have to know the numbers so we knew that one was six and this is where it defines what the chip is it's weird i mean yeah you can, it's good because you can have multiple devices pointing to the same set of data but there's no way of knowing what that's what these entries are, unless you created them yourself. But the, the uh, database itself is corrupt, because if we go and look at any of the ones by SST, there are a few in here, say the uh, 28SF040, there's nothing in there. The data exists in the database, it can't get to it though. And any attempts to modify or delete or change this data in any way whatsoever fails miserably. Uh, this was the 28SF040 device information. I'll create a new one, we'll call this 1040. Updating, are you sure? Yes. Table delete fail. <laughs> Because it's just completely and utterly corrupt and it's a, a strange custom binary format i've looked into tweaking it manually and it's rubbish <laughs> to say the least um it updates the main index but it doesn't actually update the data file that goes with it so it's just completely and utterly corrupt and can't be used. So I'm thinking I might be making my own from scratch, my own database from scratch, using this program, yes. But 
it would be nicer if I could feed in this data into the existing library, but no, I can't do that <laughs> because it's just so jank. And the documentation for it is, it's, it exists, it's 80% of it is reasonable, 20% of it, which is the 20% which covers this side of things, is a little lacking. So, uh, yeah. If I were to try and choose the it does appear that it wants to work the 28 SFO 40 I mean I can't use it or can I yeah because it says invalid ID it tries to get the ID and can't because it's the 29 SFO 40 not the 28, sorry, it's the 39 SFO40, not the 28 SFO40. It's a completely different chip. Same capacity, but can't use it. So, uh, yeah, it's awkward. This seems to be able to read it and write, it, read the database quite happily, but this doesn't seem to work too well with it. So I'm, I don't know whether it is actually corrupt or whether it's just this was written for an earlier version of the um, Super Pro software and the later version has a very very subtle change to the way the database works. But either way it's not happy. So at the moment for me to use these chips I can only use it using the algorithm generator which it's perfectly usable it's just a bit of a, a shame I can't do it all in one one uh, integrated program but it's working and I call that a win so what's the future then for this? Obviously I'm going to enjoy using it. I'm probably going to set this up permanently in one of my older systems, either the 486 or my uh, possibly my Cyrix, which is sort of permanently connected under the desk. Um, I've got some DB25 connectors coming. They're IDC ones, so uh, no soldering needed. Just crimp it onto a bit of ribbon cable. Um, should also be a bit more flexible than the really chunky thick cable you get on this which is nicer um, they're coming from China though so that's going to take forever to get here um, they'll be like uh, like this one that I this uh, 36 35 pin whatever it is that I got for uh, external drives for the for the old IBM which actually I've got uh, got here I've got a GoTech and a three and a half inch floppy on a ribbon cable for the 5150 external drive so I can have four drives on that now including the GoTech which is very useful um, so yes it'll be they're like this just slightly smaller um, so I've got a bag of those coming so I can make up some cables um, I would like to create my own version of the interface card that doesn't need bodges um, it would be nice to have the uh, faceplate all lined up properly um, but I'm pondering pondering recreating it as a an entirely apart from the uh, 25 pin connector and the headers I think the uh, jumpers as purely surface mount rather than through hole. I know it sort of goes against the idea of old school computing and through hole components and but if you're making it new 
it makes more sense to use newer components. I mean, if it weren't for the fact that it was only five volts, this, I would consider using a small CPLD instead of all the logic chips. But most CPLDs are 3.3 volts only now, so that makes it harder to work with. So I would keep it as discrete logic chips, but I would consider going to fully surface mount. It would make it a smaller circuit board, which would make it cheaper to manufacture. It would make it cheaper and easier to get hold of the components, because through-hole ones are getting harder to get at a reasonable price now. But you can still get most of them as, or you can still get them as surface mount for a lower price and higher inventory stock levels. So I'm considering creating a surface mount version of it. Um, yeah, um, and I understand now how the whole system operates, but not how it works, if that makes sense. So, writing my own software for interfacing with it is certainly a possibility. Whether I would still have it as a DOS software, or whether I would create Linux software for it, possibly. Um, I mean, it's how it operates is very simple. The ISA card is very much a dumb device. It's just, it performs three basic operations. It has a pulse generator for the IOCHRDY signal to slow everything down. It has buffering for the data bus and some address pins, and it has a small amount of address decoding logic. Um, so all it does is just send out the raw 8-bit data bus straight out through the cable, along with the lower of five, I think it is, address pins, straight out through the cable. Decodes the logic, the um, address range, and sends a, a master select signal down the cable. And then inside the actual programmer, there's all these pretty standard I.O. chips, which are just directly coupled straight onto the, the data bus using the address pins. So it's, it's like the card and the cable is just an extension of the ISA slot almost. And then everything that's in the programmer is an ISA card with all the devices in it just coupled straight onto the bus. So the software is not talking to the card. The software is talking to the I.O. chips that are in the Super Pro programmer. The card just moves the chips into an external box. So, so controlling those chips is child's play. That's well documented. This, the data sheets for all those chips are available and you can communicate with those easily. It's a question of how the chips then interface with everything else that's in the Super Pro programmer for generating all the right voltages and the logic levels and reading in the data and all that sort of thing. It is a little more tricky, but not impossible to work out. So yeah, my, making my own software for it would be a possibility. Another possibility, because it is just a simple 8-bit data bus, a few address pins and a couple of control signals on the DB25 connector, there's no reason why those signals couldn't be created artificially by a microcontroller and then have a an adapter that plugs into USB to be able to control this from any computer with USB. 
that even would be a possibility. The harder part is it requires a plus 12 volt and a minus 12 volt power supply because some chips require those negative voltages. So uh, those obviously you can't get from USB but with boost and inverting con switching power regulators you can generate those voltages. So that's a possible possible future avenue to take with it. Um, lower priority that sort of idea though I think. So I think the first the first stage is create a new version of the ISA interface card, probably surface mount. Second stage would be writing my own software for it. Third stage would be looking at the possibility of a USB interface. So yeah, that's where we are on this adventure and I think for the time being we have got about as far along on this journey as we reasonably can. Looking at the Zeltec Super Pro Universal Programmer. A lovely piece of kit. And available on eBay, but no circuits. No ISA cards for them. They suffer from the perennial problem of ISA cards. The uh, devices survive, the cards end up being thrown away and recycled with the computer they were used in. Um, that's why we, uh, I worked with Shelby at Tech Tangents on the CM153 ISA interface card for the CD, old first CD-ROM drives created. CD-ROM drives exist, but the cards to drive them would get thrown out with the computers they were in. So, yeah, that's the end of this part of the adventure. I wonder what we'll end up looking at next. Who knows? If you've got any fun bits of hardware you want to want me to delve into, by all means, contact me on Discord or by email or wherever to suggest what we may look at. But yes, well, thank you uh, for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, little look at what the Super Pro can do now it's working. And I'll see you next time.